welcome to Movable Dough. This is Steve Danielson. Join me each week as we explore the minds of living composers. We talk about their lives, their musical journeys, and of course, their music. For a complete archive of episodes, as well as access to the shorter segments called Movable Snippets, visit my website, sdcompose.com slash movable dough. Hey, this is Steve. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Movable Dough. My guest today is Giulio De Carlo, a flutist and choir director from Cantanzaro, Italy. Giulio is a self-taught composer who devotes himself to deepening his understanding of classical music. His works have been performed throughout Italy, as well as by the Salt Lake vocal artists. Giulio has been awarded several prizes through the International Youth Music Competitions, and in 2017 he composed original music for two Greek tragedies, Euripides' Medea and Aeschylus' Prometheus. Giulio De Carlo, welcome to Movable Dough. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. One of the first things that you mentioned on your bio online is that you're a flutist. How old were you when you started playing the flute? Well, I was 11 when I started playing the flute. Mm -hmm. This was uh, my very first experience with music, and I can still remember my emotions. And were you playing just for lessons, or were you part of an orchestra? I studied the flute because uh, when uh, I was a young boy, I wanted to go to conservatory. Um, I played it for lessons and also in my church with the choir that in those years sang uh, during the Mass. Uh So were you singing in the choir at this time as well? Uh, Yes, I started singing in the same choir with whom um, I played the flute. In this way, I knew polyphony and choral music for the first time. That's awesome. So would you consider yourself more of a singer now or a, a flutist? What would you think? Definitely a singer. Uh, The flute was the first part of my journey, a moment that uh, I will never forget, something that brought me to the world of music. But when I discovered singing, I found uh, my true passion. And what about your family? Did you come from a musical family? Many relatives of mine are musicians, like McCursin, uh, who is the first cello in an important Italian orchestra, Mm -hmm. or another one who teaches piano in a conservatory. Okay. Uh, But I have a special relationship with uh, an ancestor, my great-grandfather, Riccardo De Carlo, um, a composer and an um, orchestra director who left Italy at... uh, beginning of the 20th century to find his way in America. Oh, cool. I really would like to honor his memory with my activities. So with this great musical ancestry, did your family encourage you to become a musician or did they want you to become something else? (laughs) This is a great question. (laughs) Uh, Sadly, for years, in Italy, being a musician wasn't considered to be a real job. Huh. And also nowadays, people often expect that uh, if you are a musician, you must do something else at the <laughs> same time. So even though my family encouraged me uh, to become a musician, I decided to study other things. This was one of the worst mistakes of my life. (laughs) Anyway, I continued to study and practice music by myself. All right, so let's turn to your compositions. So when did you actually start writing music? Mm, I was uh, very young. I think when I was 12 or 13. Mm. After a short break, I restarted at 16, and uh, I have never stopped it. So what kind of music were you writing, and who were you writing it for? At the beginning, I wrote something for flute and uh, other wind instruments. Mm-hmm. Um, later, I started writing the music for the choir where uh, I sang and uh, played the flute. So mostly liturgical music. Okay. 
but I also composed something for some uh, secular concerts or relatives and friends' uh, weddings. Fantastic. So I know from experience that sometimes when a performer starts writing music, they don't initially think of themselves as a composer. So how long did it take you from when you started writing to begin to think of yourself as a composer? <laughs> you are absolutely right. <laughs> I can also say that uh, I am very shy. And so for a very long time, even if people encouraged me to write more music and uh, complimented me, on my composition, uh, I didn't think of myself uh, as a composer. Uh, this until about five years ago, when mm. I received my first important commission. And this made me think about my real desires and gave me the force uh, to start promoting myself and composing uh, in a more uh, professional way. Mm. So I read online that you are the director of the Polyphonic Choir Singing Cluster. So how was your group impacted by the pandemic, and what did you do to keep your ensemble together? Yes, now I am the director of the choir born from the one where I sang when I was a boy. Oh. This is fantastic. <laughs> the pandemic uh, forced us to cancel our rehearsals, but we decided to continue singing together online once a week. Uh -huh. uh, we also made four virtual choirs. I admit that this kind of singing was boring and sad, <laughs> but allowed us not to lose the bonds of friendship and keep the choir alive. Oh yeah, sure. We have been able to restart live rehearsals only this year. Uh, after almost two years of silence, if I can use this word. Yeah. And uh, even if many of us caught uh, COVID uh, during the past months, we managed to prepare our Christmas and uh, spring concerts. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad you're able to keep that going. So what do you think one of your biggest challenges have been that you've faced while becoming a composer? The biggest challenge, I think, uh, has been trying to make my music more and more appreciated and known. Mm -hmm. Moreover, I wanted uh, that uh, what I composed could soon be known in the USA, a country that I respect so much and uh, where I believe that my way of uh, writing music can be more appreciated than uh, in Italy, where... Uh, other styles are preferred. Oh, sure. I can definitely understand that. Well, maybe you and I could exchange, and I'll make your music known in the U.S., and you can make my music known in Italy. All right. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to let you know, what do you do for fun? What sort of hobbies do you have? I don't know a whole lot about uh, sort of the culture in Italy. So what sort of things do you do for fun? Well, I'm crazy about role-playing games, especially mm. Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder. I try playing these games with my friends uh, every time I can. I also play soccer, like any good Italian. <laughs> uh, I am a goalkeeper. Uh, I also like food, but uh, I have to admit I'm better at eating than cooking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I tried playing soccer when I was younger as well. Um, I was not very good, and I was definitely not a good goalie, so I definitely respect you on that. All right, I got one more question for you. Uh, I'm asking all my guests this week, or this season. Uh, who is your favorite living composer that you think we should all go check out? I love uh, many living composers. Uh, it's a long list. <laughs> but uh, if I must name uh, one of them, I say Eric Eschenbos. Oh, yeah. His music uh, has uh, something mystical and magical, in my opinion. He can uh, paint his feelings and convey what he feels in uh, his soul to the listener. Yeah, I definitely agree. All right, well, we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will listen to some of Julio's compositions. Hey, Steve here. 
I want to take just a moment of our time together to tell you about the easiest way to make and host a podcast. It's called Anchor. I use Anchor to make and host movable dough, and I've been extremely happy with the experience. They have creation tools on the site that help you create, record, publish, and share your podcast to multiple podcast streaming sources, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. The best part, it's absolutely free. No monthly cost, no hidden fees. So if you've been thinking about making a podcast, and you know you have, download the Anchor app today or visit anchor.fm to get started. Thanks for listening, and let's get back to Movable Dough. Welcome back. I'm talking today with Giulio De Carlo. Let's start today with The Hidden Garden, set for SATB Acapella Chorus. So you describe this piece as a person dissatisfied with his life who wishes to be taken away by music to wonderful worlds that he hopes will be real. First of all, who wrote the lyrics for this piece? And second, why did you write this and what does it mean to you? Thank you for these questions. About the text, I am the lyricist of the piece. Hmm. If you remember, I said that uh, abandoning music to study other things was one of the worst mistakes of my life. (laughs) So this is uh, an um, autobiographical piece telling both my sorrow for a life that I feel uh, I don't belong to and the hope that uh, one day I will be where uh, I really want to be, thanks to my music. In other words, uh, I wrote this piece because I really believe that the power of music is stronger than everything. I consider this work as a a part of my soul, uh, something very intimate, Mm -hmm. Uh, but I want to share it with the world. Okay. Well, we're now going to listen to The Hidden Garden, performed by the Salt Lake vocal artist with Dr. Brady Allred conducting.
Okay. Next, let's turn to your setting of O Manu Mysterium. This text has been set by countless composers over the centuries. So what makes yours stand out or unique? Uh, this piece embodies my most authentic style, an old-style descriptive and evocative music with a contemporary flavor. I tried to give to my setting some reminiscences of Morton uh, Lauritsen's style, uh, because when uh, I composed this piece, I was thinking uh, of uh, his music. And then I added my personal interpretation, trying to tell the mystery of an uh, infinite god who becomes so small that he finds refuge in the womb of a young woman. So, uh, in this piece, music is a means to explain theology, uh, using the notes to enhance the power of each word. And did you write this for a specific ensemble, or perhaps a specific reason? Um, The piece was originally commissioned for a reading session, held by the Italian Association of Choir Directors. Later, it was chosen for a Christmas uh, concert in Bruxelles. All right. Well, we're now going to listen to O Manu Mysterium, performed by Le Seine Vocal, Ivan Johan conducting.
All right, our third piece today is Arrivere la Stelle. This piece uses text from Dante's Inferno and was commissioned for the 700th anniversary of the death of Dante in 2021. If I could, I'd like to read the text in English. Into that hidden passage my guide and I entered to find again the world of light. And without thinking of a moment's rest, we climbed up, he first and I behind him, far enough to see through a round opening a few of those fair things the heavens bear. Then we came forth to see again the stars. What were you trying to capture or convey as you were working with these texts? Uh, With this piece, I tried to express my feelings of hope thinking about uh, the end of all the bad moments of our life, uh, including the one that we all have been living for over two years. Mm. So I placed the climax of the work on the words Arrivederle le stelle, to see again the stars, uh, like it was the cry of the humankind uh, that uh, doesn't want uh, to surrender to evil and death. Hmm. So when you're sitting down to write a new piece like this, what's your process? What do you do when you're starting a new piece? This is a great question. Uh, usually, first of all, I put my whole self in it and uh, I write it uh, all straight in a short time. Then is the moment of rationality. I go back uh, to what I have written hundreds of times and I make uh, uh, corrections until I'm satisfied with it. Uh, This way I try to unite my heart and my thought. Hmm. All right, well we are going to listen to Arrivere la Stella, which you pronounce way better than I did, uh, performed here by Coro Giovanile Calabrese, conducted by Maestro Gianfranco Cambareri.
And lastly today, we'll listen to Lights of Hope for TTBB Choir. I understand the lyrics for this piece were written by a friend of yours, Santiago Veros. It seems to be a pretty hopeful piece. Can you tell us about what was going on when you wrote it? There is a particular story behind this piece. The pandemic was in its worst moment. Death, sadness and fear were everywhere and the choral music was forced to stop. My great friend Santiago Veros had an idea. He contacted me to propose a challenge named One Day, One Piece. I had to compose a poem about hope for him and uh, he had to do the same thing for me. Then, each of us had to complete a piece for male choir in just one day. Mm. <laughs> I accepted the challenge, but I admit uh, that it took me much more than a day to finish my composition. <laughs> At the end, we had the two pieces that uh, in some uh, way worked as a bond between us ready to be performed as soon as the emergency would end. Yeah, so what was it like collaborating with your friend Santiago on this project? It was amazing. Santiago is a wonderful person, and uh, he was always so kind to me, helping me discovering a lot of things about the world of choral music and sharing his knowledge with me. Mm -hmm. As uh, he himself uh, uh, believes, I also believe that we live this life to be together and communicate with each other. And music is the best way to do this. Absolutely. All right, well, let's listen to Lights of Hope, performed here by Coro Polifonico di Ruda with Fabiana Noro conducting.
All right. Well, Julio, what are you working on now that you can tell us about? Well, I'm composing some pieces for some competitions that I'd like to participate in. Mm -hmm. And I'm searching for a conductor interested in performing a piece for mixed choir, piano and uh, percussions uh, with the text by Charles Anthony Silvestri. The piece is uh, called Forgotten and uh, it is uh, about uh, human suffering. Um, This is a collaboration I am very proud of. You can find all about this work on uh, my website. I'm trying to do my best to find a way to share my music with the choir conductors, hoping to help them with my work. Uh, Believe me, this is not uh, vainglory. (laughs) After many years of silence, I really feel the need to create bonds and relationships with people through my music. So... I want to to thank you again for this opportunity. I'm really very happy to be here with you. Fantastic. Well, if my listeners or conductors want to find out more about you and how to commission your music or perform it, where are you located online? What's your website, social media, all that sort of stuff? Uh, Yes, I have a website, juliodecarlocomposer.com where uh, you can find uh, all you need to know uh, about uh, my music, my projects, and uh, my activities. Great. I also have a YouTube channel, Giulio De Carlo, where I usually upload my music videos. If you want, you can subscribe and uh, follow me. All right. Well, hey, listeners out there, if you are enjoying this episode, please make sure you subscribe through your favorite podcast provider so you don't miss any future episodes. Movable Dough is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or just about any other podcast provider you can think of. Subscribe today to receive notifications every time I drop a new episode. Well, Julio, it's been great to get to know you today. Thank you for joining me today on Movable Dough. Thank you, Steve. It was nice to be here. My guest today was composer Julio De Carlo. If you have a recommendation for a future guest or an idea for the show, please email me at movabledoe at gmail.com. This is Steve Danielson. Keep the music moving. <laughs>